as I had mentioned um, last week, as well as on uh, Sunday, if you, if you happen to be here, and I think most of you happen to be here, um, that each week we would conduct a, a kind of a brief review of what a parable is, what the word actually means, why Jesus used them so frequently, um, how to interpret them, and things like that, okay? Now, the idea is simply to just try and not only catch everybody up, bring everybody up to speed, uh, but of course to remind ourselves and to create something of a, of a drill, just to keep these things in mind for whenever we take a look at and examine parables. And so by way of reminder, remember that uh, uh, last week and of course on Sunday, we, we talked about how Jesus was the greatest teacher who had ever lived and that uh, we said that the reason that we could know that was because that he was the actual and is the actual embodiment of truth itself, being, of course, that he is fully God. And so, therefore, then we noted that uh, because of that, the very content of his teaching was perfect, being that he is divine, okay? We also remember that uh, how the crowds were astonished by the way he taught. You'll recall um, that even his enemies said of him that no one ever spoke like this man. And uh, they even said that he was teaching them, quote, as one who had authority and not as their scribes and religious leaders. And then, of course, in addition to his ability to speak with such authority and power, we also noted that one of the most memorable, perhaps one of the most memorable, perhaps, aspects of our Lord's teaching was, of course, his use of parables and that his use of parables, unlike that of the Pharisees, was uh, designed to illustrate new revelation about the kingdom of God that they had not yet understood or had not been fully revealed as, as yet. And then we also remember that in the New Testament, the parables, they're only found in the Gospels and then only relegated to the teachings of our Lord Jesus. And in fact, are quite rare, as we discussed in the Old Testament, and I remember we we walked through the uh, Nathan, the, the prophet Nathan, when he came to David, and he was telling King David the parable of the, of the rich man and the poor man's lamb, you recall. And then we'll remember as well that <clears throat> the word parable itself basically means comparison, and that the prefix para meant something that is alongside something else. And then we discussed how the, the root of the word from where we get parable means to throw. And so we can say that parable means to throw something alongside something else. And we understood that at least in the context of our Lord's teachings of parables that, that he's teaching some important truth or, or some concept. And in order for him to clarify his meaning, he then throws the parable alongside uh, the truth to illust illustrate it and to better explain it. But we also talked about another very, very important aspect uh, to consider when we talk about the parables that Jesus used, and that was that to those that have ears to hear, Jesus used the parables as a way to bring revelation of deeper truths. But we also discussed that to those who don't have ears to hear, that Jesus had used the parables as a way of hiding the truth. And so... Jesus not only came to help people to understand the kingdom of God for those who have ears to hear, of course, but he also came as a judgment against those who have not been given an understanding and who don't care and who don't want to hear the truth. And so we, we then understood that Jesus certainly came as a savior to some, but as a judgment to others. Now, we also discussed how there are, there are a number of themes within the parables, but the, the chief theme in the parables that Jesus used was what he called the gospel of the kingdom of God, okay? And because of that, over and over throughout the parables, Jesus will then use these words, and the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is likewise or like unto, okay? And then he would throw alongside the announcement of truth a parable so that we might come to understand the mystery, if you will, of the kingdom of God, or as it's sometimes uh, rendered, kingdom of heaven. And then finally, we understood that 
that we were never to try and interpret the parables of our Lord allegorically, right? And that was to say that when we attempt to do so allegorically, we would try to find some hidden significance in every little tiny element within the parable. And we're not to do that. Rather, that although there are often parables with more than one main chief idea or theme, that what we're looking for, for the most part, is a single decisive main point in any given parable. And uh, of course, exceptions notwithstanding, of course. And so now we finally come to the, uh, this evening's examination of two very short but very similar parables that our Lord had given his disciples, which are found adjacent to one another in the book of Matthew. And if you've brought your Bibles, you might want to turn there. We we're looking at the book of Matthew and specifically the 13th chapter. Get it here. So Matthew 13. Uh, the two parables that we'll be looking at tonight are the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl of great price. And these, as I said, they're found in the 13th chapter of Matthew, beginning, <clears throat> pardon me, with verse 44 and moving through verse 46. So let's, let's go ahead and read these two parables of our Lord together, and I'm reading from the ESV, English Standard Version. So beginning with verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Verse 46, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. So the first thing that we want to highlight and sort of make note of is just the fact that Jesus, he is speaking these parables with what regard, with rather what Matthew regards as the kingdom of heaven. Now, in other parables, this, this concept, the kingdom of heaven, it's the same thing as the kingdom of God. So whenever you see kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, those two uh, are interchangeable, just, just so you're aware of that. Now, I think upon reading these two uh, parables, these very short parables, you can easily see that these parables, they are concerned with the question of value, okay? Now, we, of course, in at least our modern society, our modern culture anyway, we are perhaps used to hearing the word value in, a, in lots of different ways, a bunch of different ways. And, and one of the ways that we hear in our culture today the word value being used is when it's used in terms of ethics. So, for example, when uh, we, might, we might talk about for example, one's political values, right? We, we might hear about uh, what things are important to us as a, as a country and are therefore discussed in terms of national values. And of course, as Christians, we talk frequently about family values, especially, especially in uh, the light of, uh, or in light of, I should say, the world's values these days. And so we see the word value being equated often with the idea of ethics or principles, okay? But the idea of value and how we today frequently use the term values, it's not the same thing at all. Value as a word has to do with the subjective appraisal of worth to an individual, okay? Now that's to say what we hold to be important to ourselves or worth to ourselves or something to be seen as significant or meaningful, but to ourselves. And that can simply be a matter of personal preference. If you've ever, for example, studied economics, you may have learned about or remember or recall the theory of subjective value, right? So an example might be that you're not able to tell me how much uh, my car's value is to me you can certainly tell me what value my car is to you, 
right, if you desire to purchase it. But we don't have exactly the same, uh, same value systems. And this is one of the reasons that how money is uh, spent or used within the home or the family is one of the top reasons for divorce in America. I think it's like number three, according to a number of surveys. Arguments over money. Now, because when two people, they get married, they don't necessarily bring the exact same value system into the marriage as their partner does. We know that. And every marriage, whether it is a marriage of the very, very rich and, or the very, very poor, involves the joint property and a joint property of finite value, that is money or resources. And so for, you might think of it like that every time a dollar is spent on one thing, that that represents a lost opportunity for it being spent on something else, okay? Now, if you have a finite amount of money in your house, and the man, for example, might want to buy some new hunting gear, and the woman might want to buy new sheets for the bed, you can have a conflict over that because the man values newer hunting gear more than sheets, and the woman, for example, values sheets more than new hunting gear, and so on. And I know I'm looking at you, Joe, but I'm not talking about you specifically. And so we have the problem of value and where it relates itself to um, ethics. And where it relates itself to ex ethics has to do not, not, not with that which is subjective, but rather that which is objective, okay? Now, ethics has to do not, how do I say this, with not so much what we esteem or what we hold in high worth or value, but rather ethics has to do with what we should do, right? Now, when you relate those two questions, we can see that God has a value system and we have our value systems and our value systems don't always agree with what system of value God is, has. And so where this matter becomes ethical, at least as Christians, we have an ethical imperative to bring our personal value systems into line with the values that God himself assigns to things in this world, right? Now, Jesus, in giving his announcement of the breakthrough of the kingdom of God, he's announcing something here of infinite value to people who, for the most part, don't place a very high uh, value upon it. And so he gives these two brief parables to illustrate his point in that regard. Now, the first, of course, is of a man who finds a great treasure in a field. Now, we, of course, have lots of uh, movies and, and stories and uh, tales and books and so forth about uh, treasure hunts and, and pirates of the Caribbean and, and so forth who They'll bury great chests and hordes of treasure on remote islands. And then, you know, of course, they, they create a map and then they leave the map so that they can go back and recover that treasure and those chests at some point down the road. And so they, they make the map and, you know, X marks the spot, that kind of a thing. But the ship goes down, right? And, and nobody knows what happens to the map. And then Sooner or later, somebody finds the map, and they all get excited, and they all go treasure hunting, hoping to find the buried treasure. That's the plot line of a lot of these stories and movies. Well, it turns out that in Jesus' giving of this parable that he is dealing with some actually very familiar imagery, uh, at least for the people he was speaking the parable to in that time. In other words, that original audience would have understood not only the cultural context, but also the legality of it without any explanation needed. Now, it turns out that, that hiding your treasure, if you had a field, for example, or on your property, was a pretty common occurrence. That was a common practice, particularly in the Lord's day. Now, it was not uncommon for, for vast amounts of money and jewels and various treasures to to be hidden secretly in, in fields where people would know where they buried it in order to keep it safe. They certainly didn't go down to the, uh, 
you know, First National Bank of, of Jericho where they could deposit their valuables and their safety deposit boxes. They didn't have savings and loans. They didn't have uh, brokerage accounts. They, they didn't have uh, things of that nature. And so they frequently hid their money by digging a hole in the ground where only they knew about it. And I mean, think also about how maybe in lands where war was frequent or upheaval was common, you might have situations where you might gather all of your, your valuables and, and bury them ahead of an invading army, for example. And because you certainly knew that they would, once arriving in your land, would come and steal whatever they could find, and so you wanted to make it very difficult for them to do so. And so with regard to this parable, maybe the, the person who buried it, let's just say the person who buried it dies and, and never recovers their treasure. And then so time, perhaps it passes, and let's say that everybody has forgotten about it, and this particular man in the parable, he happens to be working in a field one day, and let's say he, he's working and he hears a clank with his shovel and he sees that he has uncovered a vase with a vast fortune contained in it. And apparently he doesn't know the owner of the field and Jesus doesn't go into a whole bunch of detail here on this point except to say that the man then goes and sells everything that he has, all of his possessions. Now, this guy has this one all-consuming desire, and that is to raise enough money so that he can go and buy that field where he knows that the treasure is hidden, and then once he owns the field, and then the treasure that is buried there becomes now his possession, right? So he doesn't steal the treasure. He simply tries to find a way to earn enough money to buy the field, now, we would say that, that he stole it if he discovers the treasure, for example, deep in the ground, and then he pulls it out, and he dumps it into his backpack, and he hot-foots it right out of there, right? I mean, that, that, that would be clear that he had stolen it, but he didn't, he didn't do that. As I said, he put it right back in the ground. So he goes home, and he liquidates absolutely everything that the guy owns in order to buy this field. And it was funny because as I was preparing this message and I was reading through this parable, I, I mean, I couldn't help but to wonder what his wife must have been thinking. I mean, can you imagine the reaction of his family and his friends? And he grabs all of his jewels and he throws it out there. He grabs every title deed, every, every whatever he owns, and he puts it out there and he, he brings in the auctioneer and on they go and he's starting to try to get as much money as he can. But the point of the parable is actually a very simple one. That this guy, he had found something that was so valuable, so valuable that nothing else, nothing else in the whole world would do for him that he might possess it. I mean, he would give up everything that he had, sell everything that he could so that he could buy that field because he knew there was a treasure there of inestimable, infinite, priceless value. And so this guy is so overjoyed, he's so overwhelmed by his discovery of the value of this particular treasure. And then, of course, Jesus, we know, throws another parable right alongside of this one, this time of a merchant, and in particular, in this case, of a jewelry merchant. Uh, this is a guy who would have been in the business of buying and selling pearls, you might think of him, therefore, as a type of wholesaler. So he would seek out pearls, and he would try and resell them at a higher value. It's sort of, uh, sort of reminiscent to me, anyway, of that uh, what was that reality show years ago where these guys would, would travel around the country and they'd, you know, go looking through people's barns and attics and uh, you know all the all that stuff, and they'd seek out the uh, antiques and furniture and automobiles and, you know, all the all that stuff and so forth. And then they would try to maybe refurbish some of it or restore some of it and then resell them for a much higher amount of money. And that's a whole lot like what this merchant was, except with regard to pearls. Now, apparently in this particular part of the Near East, per pearls themselves, they were, they were much more rare uh, than they are nowadays. And pearls could be significant such that they could have a far, far higher, a far greater value even 
than diamonds, uh, rubies, emeralds, gold, all those things in those days. I mean, you'd have to imagine how dangerous it would be to procure them in the first place, right? You'd have these free divers who would basically have to tie a rock around their waists and cast themselves over the edge of the boat, right? Get yanked to the floor of the ocean, dangerous depths, you got sharks, all sorts of other fun stuff. And then once they're at the bottom, they've got a limited amount of time to dig around in the muck looking for oysters. It's really dangerous stuff. So if you had pearls, you bet you had yourself a fortune. And it sort of brings a new depth to the word picture that Jesus gave when he said not to cast your pearls before swine. I mean, the idea of casting something so valuable before people who have nothing but contempt for the truth would have been absurdity at his grandest level in that case. And so pearls were were established to have been of immense value and could even be considered great investments in a sense because they would have increased in value over time. You might have some who would have invested in real estate, for example. You you might have uh, somebody bury their wealth in a field, like a savings bank type of thing, and then others would have invested in pearls like this particular merchant, at least described here in this parable. But these two parables, they were not simply about investing. That's not the point of these parables. After all, each one did what we might today consider very foolish. After all, the the one sold everything to buy one pearl, and the other sold everything to buy one piece of real estate. And so we'll see that uh, we'll see that actually these parables make a spiritual point as we move along here. So this merchant he has a significant collection of pearls, and then one day, as the parable says, he comes upon this absolutely exquisite pearl that was so lustrous, so absolutely incredible, mind-bogglingly marvelous, and so beautiful that all of the rest of the pearls in this guy's collection must have seemed like spitballs. The man had to have said to himself, I have to have that pearl. I must own that pearl. And so the guy goes and he sells his entire collection all of his jewels, he sells his whole business, he divests himself effectively of everything to one end, and that was, I must have that pearl, the pearl of great price. And so you see the common point in both of these parables is that you have something extremely valuable that is worth selling everything that you have so that you may possess it. And Jesus is saying, this, this is how valuable the kingdom of God is. Now let's go back to the subjective theory of value that, we, that I mentioned a couple minutes ago and just ask some hypothetical questions. Let's say, let's say you have, for example, a shoemaker, okay? And then let's say that this shoemaker, he manufactures one pair of shoes and he figures that it costs him $10 to make this one pair of shoes. And then let's say that this shoemaker goes to the shoe store owner, and he sells those shoes, let's say, for a wholesale price of $15. Who profits? Well, the shoemaker, right? He paid $10 to have them made. He sells them for a $15 wholesale cost, thereby profiting $5. Okay. Now, he makes $5 above that wholesale cost. We can know, therefore, that he profited. But now let's say that the owner of the shoe store takes those shoes, and he marks them up, let's say. He, after buying them for $15, he marks them up to $25. And then let's say a customer comes in, and he buys those shoes for $25. Who profits? Well, the store owner, right? I mean, he bought them for 15 he marked them up for 10 for a total of $25, customer buys them, he makes $10, he profits. Okay, but who else profits in this example? Well, how about the consumer? How about the customer who actually buys the shoes? You say, what? How does the customer profit by buying a pair of shoes? Think of it like this. The minute that the store owner 
let's say he puts a tag on those shoes that's higher than what the customer values those shoes for, what will the consumer do? They won't buy them, right? They'll walk right past them and look elsewhere. But if the price is $25 and the customer wants the shoes more than he wants the $25 in his pocket, he'll make that deal, right? And that's the way it's supposed to work, and that's the way it used to work back then. So in that sense, the consumer profited. It's kind of like the way we used to do things when we would barter. You might think of an example like a cattle rancher, right? Let's say the cattle rancher might make a deal with a shoemaker. The shoemaker, he's, uh, he's very hungry, and he's got 100 pairs of shoes. Uh, he certainly can't eat them, and he certainly can't wear all 100 pairs of shoes, right? Well, let's say that the, the cattle rancher, he's got 1,000 steaks in his freezer, and he certainly can't eat all those steaks, and he finds that his feet are cold, right? So let's say they get together, and they decide they're going to make a deal trading steaks for shoes. It's an interesting business idea. Write that down, somebody. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, it's the simple kind of transaction. There's a mutual profitability going on there, right? But we often miss the point that in a free economy, nobody tells us that we have to buy something. When you purchase, when you make a purchase, you are exercising your system of values. And so Jesus, he goes very, well, he goes further. We'll just say he goes further with this. And then he begins to talk about how our individual subjective values come into play here. Now, when he's talking about swapping out or purchasing, he's talking about exchanging. And he gets sort of questioned about the rate of exchange, as it were. And so he asks the question, what will a man gain in exchange for his soul? Now, let's say we had this situation in our own life where the fire department, they call and they say to you that a fire has broken out in your home, and they tell you that they're not going to be able to save the house, and you have five minutes to go in there and snatch up everything that you can from the contents of your home before it's too late. But you know you have a five-minute window of safety to go in there and re retrieve from your house things that are valu valuable to you. Well, what do you grab? I mean, I, I, I've never really thought about that question. Like, if that happens, what, what do you grab? I mean, there's probably, I don't know, do you, do you go into the, the, the garage and get your car out? Do you uh, run to the dresser, get all your jewels, maybe? I, 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 it's, not, it's not something I really think about. I think that if I had that opportunity, I might run in there and grab a few books, a few rare books that I have, my grandmother's Bible, photo albums maybe, something like that. But I know that I would try to get exactly whatever I had of value in my house in that five minutes. Things, and how I would make the appraisal of its worth would be what can I take out of here that I cannot replace? What can I, what can I never go back to a store and buy again, right? Those kinds of things. And so I would put a lot of value on those things that I cannot replace uh, because I can't just go and buy them again at another store, right? And so Jesus is saying, what is your value system here? How important to you is your soul? Now, we know that the, your body is very important to you. We know that the medical professionals have effectively become the um, high priests of our culture. And we know that at least from an economic system, that physicians are far more highly valued than, for example, ministers. And that has something to say about the degree to which we consider the worth of our souls. And Jesus said, what are you going to trade? What will you give in exchange for your soul? What would you trade for your salvation. Now, I can't imagine a Christian being willing, be, being willing to trade anything for their salvation. The first century Christians we know would not exchange their very lives for their souls because they had found that treasure, and they had found the pearl of great price. 
And they were willing to lay down their lives because they realized that in the, their whole lives, there was nothing that was so precious, nothing so valuable as to possess him. You know, the pearl of great price, it's not even a jewel. It's not a pearl. It is a person. And if you have him, you have everything. And so, again, we see that these parables, they communicate a spiritual truth, that everything in this entire world that is deemed worthwhile or important is counted as sheer loss when compared with the surpassing value of knowing Christ and being part of his kingdom. After all, the kingdom is inestimable. It is priceless in nature. In Christ, we have a treasure, brothers and sisters, that is eternal, it is incorruptible, it is undefiled, and it is reserved in heaven for us as believers. And therefore, we are are rich beyond comparison. And then consider that the kingdom of God, consider that it is a heavenly treasure laying buried, as, as it were, if you will, in the field of this accursed, corrupt, sin-sick world. And then consider how it is a prize that, if found, is sufficient to make every single one of the earth's poor, miserable, blind, and sinful fallen creatures, and I'm talking about us, immeasurably wealthy for all eternity. This treasure is salvation, It is the forgiveness of sin, bless you. It is the love of God. It is his peace. It is his joy, his virtue, his goodness, his very presence, his smile. It is Christ himself. And that's why only a total fool would not trade everything he owns to gain it. Another aspect to these parables, at least with regard to The kingdom of God is that the kingdom itself is not physically visible, right? Jesus said in Luke 17, verse 20, that the kingdom of God comes with no fanfare, that most people pay absolutely no attention to it at all. We're also told in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11, that no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. If you're taking notes, you can write this down too, that John 3, 3, you'll recall this, that unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is therefore hidden to the carnal, unregenerate mind. Now, this treasure isn't highly esteemed by that person. It's, it's, it's certainly not discovered by most people because as Romans tells us in the 8th chapter, verse 7, and I ladies' study is probably roughly in that in that area of Romans, that the carnal mind is enmity with God, right? Now, this would explain why ungodly people, that is, the people of the world, would have no understanding at all why it is that Christians are passionate about the glory of God. They have no clue as to why we would prize the kingdom of God so much when it means absolutely nothing to them. They can't even begin to fathom why it is that someone would would willingly submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ, nor why someone would give up the pleasures of sin and earthly delight for, for heavenly joy, for eternal joy, because for them to understand that would fight against truly every natural instinct in the human heart in its natural fallen state. People are just flat blind to the riches of the kingdom of God. And to a large extent, it explains the absolute decay of our culture and society today. Sinners are not naturally inclined to seek after God. In fact, Romans 3.11 tells us that there is none who seek after God. Now, another lesson here, of course, is that the kingdom of God is given personally. And why is this important? Remember that the key figure in each of these two parables is an individual. And keeping in mind that the imagery is important because Jesus was teaching a people who were confident 
that simply by virtue of being part of the nation of Israel, that they were automatically granted entry and given a part of the kingdom of God, right? And so lots of people in our own day, they do the exact same thing. Just by virtue, pardon me, of being baptized, for example, of attending church faithfully or giving faithfully or what have you, that they will automatically share in the eternal riches of Christ by virtue of those formalities. But I think another lesson found here is that salvation itself carries a high cost, that having a saving faith is expensive because at its root, a saving faith, a real authentic faith is an exchange of all that we are for all that Christ is. Salvation is an exchange of all that we are for all that Christ is. Authentic faith, real faith, is a faith that yields without any conditions to both Lord and Savior. Now, obviously, that isn't to somehow suggest that we somehow lose every, every single sinful tendency or gain instantaneous victory the very moment that we receive Christ over bad habits and besetting sins and so forth. But it does mean that from our newly regenerated hearts that we push back against, we fight against sin, and we gain a love for righteousness, that the change of our heart is a fruit of the regeneration that's taken place. It's a proof of our union with Christ. Now, those who never come to repentance and who lack any love for righteousness at all have never truly believed we remember how Jesus himself constantly turned people away every time they showed up and demonstrated a superficial faith that lacked any kind of commitment at all. And we need to hear the, we, we constantly, in my opinion, in my estimation, we really need to hear these parables. Because Jesus is saying that in the value system of God, the kingdom of God that is brought through Jesus Christ is the thing that surpasses every other thing. Any stuff that we can accumulate in this world, we must have the pearl of great price. We must have that treasure that's buried in, in the field because there is nothing, absolutely nothing we can compare with it in terms of its value. We need, I think, we need to have an audit from time to time, regu regularly perhaps, just a spiritual audit of our value systems and just to kind of see whether our values line up with the values of God. We are called, after all, to, to seek the mind of Christ. And that means that we are to love what Jesus loves. We are to hate what Jesus hates. We are to, to chase after and pursue the things that Jesus pursues. And, of course, run from and flee from the very things that Jesus would have us run from and flee from. That is what the life of the Christian is all about. Let us count the costs of following Christ. Because if we do so thoughtfully we will surely realize that the pearl is so valuable and the treasure so rich that it is worth letting go of every temporal pleasure for. In the words of Pastor Dale when he was discipling me a few years ago, while I was in, uh, well, he was in Seattle, he said, if we would just let go of that $10 bill that we hold on to so firmly, we would realize that God is trying to hand us $10 billion. So with that... Uh, I think we will close our study, and as I say, uh, as of uh, Sunday, I should have further, further updates from the mission field, so let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for these truths. I just personally thank you from a position of um, having spent time in your word. I can, uh, I mean, I can never, no one can ever spend too much time. There's no such thing. In fact, it's one of the things that I know personally I look forward to when, when I walk into heaven is that I get an eternity to discover you. And then after a thousand eternities, there's yet so much more to discover about you. I love that. That's so encouraging. So, Father, we thank you that um, in the limited time that we had tonight, we were able to take some of your word and digest it. I just do ask, Father, that you would cause it to as I mentioned, the, the, the spiritual audit that we would cause our own values to begin to line up with the values that you've assigned. And that's a daily struggle. We understand that. But, Father, it's by the work of your Holy Spirit through your word that you're able to accomplish that. And we not only invite that, we, 
we desperately ask that you, you cause us to submit to it because that, that, that process, though painful, it's eternal. The transformation is a beautiful thing. And so, Father, we just ask that you would cause us to look more and more like you each day. And we thank you for this. And, Father, if there are any among us, brothers and sisters in Christ, who are physically here or joining us online or who are viewing this at a later date, that, Father, we always have things that are upon our shoulders that we carry. And I know that, that I'm really paraphrasing here, but your word tells us that our, our, our shoulders are far too narrow to carry those things, that we're to cast those cares at your feet. And so, Father, I just ask that we all just collectively, whatever it is that's weighing us down, whatever anxiety that we've chosen to hold on to, even to this day, Lord, that we just consciously bring it up in our mind, we sense it, and we now give it to you, Father, because you're the only one who can take it. And we just thank you, Father God, and ask that you bring about a healing, if it's a sense of perhaps forgiveness that we need, Lord, if it's a if it's some physical ailment, Father, we, we ask that you be glorified in however you decide to do your thing, but overall that your will be done in all these things. And we just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.